Well, thanks, Lee, and thank you, Kathy, for being here with me. Um, I am really excited for this conversation. I feel like you and I have the newsiest conversation to have at this moment, because if there was a topic in the headlines right now, it's trade, economic diplomacy, and where we're going from here. And it's interesting, we were chatting a little bit in the green room before, and I think we both agree that we're at a, an interesting moment, um, potentially a very rich moment. We're probably not going to reset to the 1990s or the 1980s. Um, you know, we've been through three or four decades in which there's been a lot of economic globalization and there's been some pretty great statecraft as well. But there's a perception certainly amongst a lot of people, not just in the U.S., but in many countries that economic globalization has run a little bit uh, too far ahead in some cases of national politics. Um, and international diplomacy, and how can we re-moor that? How can we make sure we don't end up back in the 1930s, um, but that we end up somewhere in the middle in a better place? Um, and I'd love it if you would just take a, a few moments, having lived through all this in the private sector at Apple, you know, the, the, the probably the best example of a company that has exemplified all these changes, but also at state. Where are we? How would you describe this new era? Is it deglobalization? Is it regionalization? Is it Globalization 2.0? Well, that is a great question. And I am so delighted to be here with you. And thank you so much for, um, for being a partner in this conversation uh, and to Meridian. Um, I think where we are, after spending two years traveling the country and then doing a little bit virtually because of COVID, um, talking to people, we went to 39 cities. Um, every region of the US, uh, talking to people about globalization and international trade, which is clearly linked to foreign policy in, in most people's minds. Mm. Um, it was, what was fascinating to me was that uh, we did informal interviews and focus groups and the word associations with globalization were not negative. And I had expected that, that's been the conventional wisdom. Um, but people seem to really understand that there's lots of benefits. And um, my key uh, phrase is strawberries in winter. Everybody talked about that. Um, and, um, and people understood that, you know, that globalization had also raised up the living standards in other countries, um, though they were concerned about that and they were concerned about the environment, regardless of political party, um, in terms of what's happening overseas and, you know, companies leaving to go someplace where there was, um, you know, perhaps not as good conditions. Um, but that said, I think um, what was interesting to me and what we were talking about in the green room is to see how individual cities have looked at how they can have globalization be a part of their economic development. And every city does it differently. There's not a one size fits all, um, but there is a way and I've certainly seen it. I've seen it in Pittsburgh. I've seen it in Greenville, South Carolina. I've seen it in, um, I've seen it in the Twin Cities. I've seen it at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, you know, um, there is a way to actually be part of the global world, but maintain your own um, your own localness um, and your own culture and and make good jobs and good opportunities for people who are um, who are in your local area. And I think, but what I found is that there's a huge disconnect between people making policy in Washington and all these people doing all these actions. And the, the folks in the rest of the country don't really understand what policy is going on and how that policy affects them. Um, go ahead. No, that's a, that's a very interesting point. And I'd love to, I, first of all, I'm fascinated that you say that when people like globalization, they're thinking strawberries in winter. And I'm assuming by that, you're talking about trade agreements that allow us to get strawberries in winter. It, it's interesting because what that made me think of is a technological shift that's going on too, because I've actually interviewed, you know, people that are doing vertical farms where you can grow strawberries in winter, but you grow them up the wall in your house right. or in your company. Right. So, so, and I say all this to, to point out that we're at a really interesting moment technologically where 
you know, regardless of what happens, companies are doing things, can do things, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, uh, decentralized uh, currencies even that are more regional. How is all that going to play out in the future, do you think? I want to ask that as a company question, and then I want to turn to the statecraft. I think uh, I think it's hard to say. I mean, companies will take advantage of opportunities that there are, for sure. Um, and they are going to continue to march ahead, particularly in the tech world. I mean, that's what I saw at Apple, that, comp- that you know, you have... You have rooms full of engineers who love to create and do things and produce things. And they're going to keep doing that. Um, And so part of the question is, how is the table set to make that um, productive for our own country, for our own regions, et cetera? And I don't think that that means that you have to say, we're going to put up a wall around the US and you know everything has to be done domestically. I think naturally things are going to start devolving more regionally. Um, mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that there won't be some things that are going to be you know, the more traditional globalized things. Um, and certainly the internet has made that in the services industry very, very um, Likely, it's going on now all the time. You know, I I met a small business in Ann Arbor that is doing kind of sales force for small businesses, proudly told me they were in 28 countries and language was the only thing holding them back from being in more. And they're this like little tiny business. Mm -hmm. And when I asked them, well, what does international trade mean to you? And this is where the gap is. They said, well, it doesn't mean anything to us. We're services. That's about manufactured things. And so, you know, that's where I see that there is a big gap. Things are happening. And actually, the table was set for them to be able to do that by the rules in the WTO, by the General Agreement on Trade and Services that got negotiated. But they didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, it's a great point because if you look at where job growth and where economic growth in the U.S. and many wealthy countries is going to come from, it's services, and in particular healthcare because of demographic shifts, technological shifts. How, how is that shift that's already happening, regardless of trade policy, how is that affecting how diplomats are going to think about trade and how the U.S. is not only going to message, but what are the real policies going to be going forward? Well, I think that's something that I know the Biden administration is looking at. Um, and um, I don't think we're quite there yet in, in knowing on what does that mean. Um, and, you know, in terms of diplomacy, in terms of trade, um, we still have to be engaged. And I think those big uh, principled multilateral agreements are actually good foundations. Are they sufficient? They're not completely sufficient. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have to think more about that. And, you know, time has outpaced what's in there. So there's nothing on digital, really. Um, And and so we have to look at some of those those questions. In the meantime, regions are starting to make rules, if you think about even what the EU is doing on privacy, Mm -hmm. that affect everybody. Right, because they're going across borders. And so, and now they're talking about doing a carbon tax, you know, on goods coming from countries who aren't sufficiently managing their environment. And so I think regions are looking at look at what's going on in Southeast Asia, et cetera, with the RCEP, you know, with the with the Chinese. And that's going to keep on going on because it's natural to trade with your neighbors anyway. Right. natural to have good relationships with your neighbors. Of course, that doesn't always happen. But yeah. um, but I think, you know, those are things we have to look at is to make sure that our, that we have strong regions. Yeah. Um, as well as looking multilaterally. Well, and the administration has certainly made it clear that they want to see, you know, transatlantic and liberal democratic agreement on tax, on digital regulation, um, and to modernize trade rules. Um, it's interesting, you pointed out we are sort of in a new regionalized world. You've got the US and Europe maybe on page with some things, maybe not on page with other things. I mean, I was quite fascinated by the EU-China trade agreement. Um, we are living in this sort of one world, two systems paradigm um, in which 
it just seems like there are going to be different rules of the road, either official or unofficial. I mean, how, how do both diplomats and companies, multinational companies that now know, okay, there are going to be different rules in China, you know, it, it is a different game. How should they be thinking about that? Um, is, is there a mantra that, that, that they should be telling themselves every day when they get up in the morning and try to do business in the, in the world at the moment? Well, I think, you know, companies, um, a lot of companies have been doing business in China for a long time, and there's always been a different system there. Um, that system has gotten increasingly um, less difficult to navigate, I would say. It still has its difficulties, um, but there is some more ability to control your own um your own business uh, than there used to be. You don't have to join venture. You can, you know, th there are more even rules that are set forth um, in areas that weren't at all regulated. When I first went to Apple, there was no, there were no rules about how you could operate an online sale of goods in China. There just were zero <laughs> rules. And we actually helped the Chinese government craft those. Um, and so that, of course, makes companies nervous because they want to know what is the playing field I'm dealing with. And I think to the extent that becomes more transparent in China, it's easier for them, even if it's a different system. Um, you know, more from a policy perspective, that system presents huge challenges to purely market-based systems, not that any system is purely market-based, but- and so I think there is where a lot of the rub comes in, because companies want to have access to the 1.3 billion people in China market. And so they're willing to take risks to do that. But if you step back and you're a policymaker and you say, well, wait a minute, state-owned enterprises and that system are not competing fairly with our own enterprises and yeah. we need to be cognizant of that and what do we need to do about that and simply pressuring china to change its whole system is probably not going to be a successful strategy uh absolutely it's interesting you know you're you're putting me in mind of some of the things the biden administration said around climate change i mean climate change is one of those areas where there actually may be some overlap in terms of at least vectoral goals and um and as the administration has said, this is about competing, but also cooperating. Um, I'm curious how that works in practice, what that means for supply chains, um, particularly at a time, uh, you know, when China is a more developed country. It, 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 in, in some way, I think about China, I wonder if you would agree, as sort of like the US in the post-World War II period, like huge single language, well, not single language, but, you know, huge unified market with plenty of room to run, natural that it should be having its own supply chains. How does all that play out? Well, I think that's that's going to be a huge question, right? And, um, you know, we have had integrated supply chains going back and forth, right? We've sold ships to China. China sold us all kinds of inputs as well. And that's been going on. And I think there is a question, you know, especially with COVID, people became very worried that, wait a minute, we don't have our own domestic production. And I do think there's going to be a relook at what is critical to our economy and how do we incentivize domestic production here mm -hmm. uh, for those critical things yeah. but i think one thing i think that's very challenging about that is who knows what tomorrow's crisis is going to be and so you know it's very hard i think for government to micromanage the economy and yeah. so i think that it presents a real challenge and how to go about that presents a real challenge because we want to keep the innovative spirit we have here. And I think we want to keep leadership for developing these new things in the private sector. It's not something government can do, but government can certainly fund things. And that is, I think, something that's going to have to be looked at. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you're, you're making me think about um, the way in which uh, in the 50s and 60s, not that we're going back there, but that there was a kind of a public underwriting of technology. There was a public investment into certain technologies. Demand was created by federal procurement. I mean, is that, rather than picking sectors, is that kind of where you see things headed? I think that 
Um, I don't know if that's where things will be headed, but I think that public underwriting of certain things, I mean, if you think about the internet, it grew out of DARPA, you know, the, out of the defense department and look what it has spawned. Um, and I don't think anybody knew that at the time. Right. So I think we've got to keep doing that kind of thing. And I think then there's a real question about, um, do we adopt a more industrial policy as opposed to the completely hands-off or mostly hands-off um, system that we've had? And we're probably the most hands-off of any developed country yeah. uh, in that respect. And so, you know, I think the question is, do we need to adjust a little bit so that we can continue to compete? Because nobody else in the world is just sitting back and saying, well, you know, we're just going to not, we're, we, the government are going to keep out in terms of funding. Well, also it's interesting because if you go back to Alexander Hamilton, I mean, Americans kind of invented industrial policy in some ways, and yet we're the only ones not, not practicing it. And China certainly took a lot of lessons from various points in American history uh, in terms of kind of fueling basic R and D in high growth sectors. Um, just in, in the last few minutes, a um, couple of questions, one kind of macro and one micro. Um, if you're looking at the chessboard today, we want a sustainable planet. Um, we want to incentivize companies, particularly as we have international tax reform, um, to keep assets in the US, to uh, keep jobs, some jobs at least in the US. Um, we want to uh, underscore digital, uh, democratic values that are in line with liberal democracy. What are the pieces that you would move? Or, or are there, I don't want to say low hanging fruit because there probably isn't any, but are there a couple of strings that could be pulled right now? Do you well, I think one of the low hanging fruit really is making sure that everybody in this country has access to the internet, huh. um, to fast internet. Yeah. And, um, and I think that that's low hanging fruit globally too, in terms of democracy yeah. uh, and in terms of people's economic well being. The World Bank did a study um, that said that a 10% increase in, in, in internet penetration in a developing country led to a two percentage point increase in GDP. Wow. Amazing. So, I mean, it's like the best tool. And we need it here too, I think. Absolutely. So I think that is a huge low-hanging fruit that we have to spend some time um, making sure happens. Um, you gotta, you gotta like the infrastructure bill for, for that reason, you know, the broad yeah. And I noticed that, th that people keep saying, well, the in building out internet isn't really infrastructure. And I just want to pull out my hair saying, oh my God, you know, it, it is the modern road. We have to have it. Yeah, 100%. In the last couple of minutes on your listening tour, was there anything in particular, aside from strawberries in winter, uh, that, that stuck in your mind, a comment that kind of summarized um, where Americans are with all this right now? Um, I don't know if I could say one comment, but what we found is that people started off by saying, I don't know anything about trade. And then when you started talking to them about their lives, they're like, wow, trade and globalization pervades my life. Um, and I want to know more, but where do I go to find out? And so that is what really has stuck with me. Um, fascinating. Yeah. And we want input, right? We want to, if, if you're a policymaker, you want to know, like, what can you do that's going to help people? And they're just, as I said, there is a disconnect there. Um, and I think we've got to form that connection back if we want legitimacy and we want policy that's generally going to promote economic development, not just in the U.S., but more globally, too. You know, Kathy, you're reminding me of a reporting anecdote from years ago. I went to visit Caterpillar in the Midwest, um, which makes products not only domestically, but for many international markets. And the workers on the line could tell, tell you more about globalization than many economists that I know, um, because they were living it every day. And they actually put little flags on each, of, each piece of mach machinery to, to kind of designate where it was going. It was just an interesting way to connect those dots. Um, 
Well, much more to say, and we, we will certainly keep talking offline. I hope that you all will keep uh, listening online. It's been a pleasure to be here with you today, and, and thanks for the conversation. I'll turn it back over to the Meridian folks now. Thanks so much.